anybody who has twins or is expecting twins, please let them know I exist. We are there to support them. Um, so I will be moderating our panel on getting back to you. And first what I would like is for each of our uh, panelists to introduce themselves and just give us a quick info on what you guys do. So we're gonna start right here. Great, hi, I'm Lauren. Um, I'm the editorial director of momtrends.com. We are a lifestyle website for mom. We are solutions for moms, finding ways to make mom's life a little bit easier um, and a little bit more fun and stylish and exciting because, you know, the mom years are in the trenches, so we're trying to help. Um, I have a, a six-year-old and a three-and-a-half-year-old. My name's Eric. Is this thing on? Is this, I have a really loud voice, so that'll help. Oh, check that out. <laughs> I don't have to use the super loud voice, but I will. Uh, my name's Eric Benin. I do uh, social media, blog writing, and graphic design stuff for City Dads Group, and specifically for Chicago Dads Group here in Chicago. Uh, we're a group of dads groups across the uh, country. Uh, I think now we're up to like 36 of them, so we're in cities all, all across the U.S., but we, uh, here in Chicago, our focus is getting dads together with other other fathers and celebrating the fact that we like to do stuff with our kids and creating those networks that we kind of lose when we have kids and our friends don't <laughs> and uh, making those connections. So Chicago Dads Group and Making Dads. Hi guys, my name is Erin Heidelberger, the Git Mom. I am a mom of three boys and I am the only parent coach in the country who advocates and cheerleads for mommy because at Get Mom we believe if mommy has it together the entire family runs more smoothly. So we are all about sleep and schedule and carving out happy mommy time. Awesome. And I also have children that I forgot to mention. But. <laughs> The lads in my life, um, my twin boys, they are five and a half and they just started kindergarten. So it's a pretty exciting time. Um, so what I would like to first talk about is when I heard the name of the panel, Getting Back to You. My first question was, getting back to you. So after you've had children, getting back to who you were before children, is that even possible? Is that what we actually want? Are we just irrevocably different after we have children? Can we get back to somewhat of what we were and now we're adding on to a new world that we're introduced to? Can you guys talk to that? Does anybody have a thought they'd like to jump in? I'm gonna jump in, do it, because <laughs> that is what Get Mom is all about. So at Get Mom, we believe just because you have had a child, you are not dead and you are still a woman with your own wants and needs and this there is science and there is reality based facts that prove if you maintain a sense of yourself you will then instill routine and schedule to your children and children and humans thrive on routine because they know exactly what to expect versus should we maybe brush our teeth? Well, of course, like, who wants to brush our teeth? Like, I'll just live with sweaters all day, right? So, but if mom is rested and confident and happy and she speaks in a strong voice, vo voice to her children, in three minutes we're going to brush our teeth, in two minutes we're going to brush our teeth, in one minute we're going to brush our teeth, our children are like, all right, I like this idea. I'm going to do this. Because we then set up for our children, here's the routine. And so, just because you've had a child, you can still fit in your needs when your child's on a schedule. Because when mommy knows when her child is sleeping, she can then fit in her time around her child's time. So of course, we have to, like our child comes first, but mommy's not dead. Mommy still has needs, the family still has needs, daddy has needs, daddy, we want daddy to be happy, we want our partner to be happy, we want the entire family to flow. So when your child's on a schedule and sleeping through the night and on a schedule, well then you can fit your time around your child's time. So yes, the family, yes, of course, you're not, your same, you're not the same person before you have a baby, but it's not over. And I'll 
take that step further. Like, I, my kids are now going into uh, high school, junior high school, and high school, right? So you you have a baby, and it's a wonderful, exciting moment, and it's not going to last. And it's really easy, and, and, and from this point where I am, it's really easy to let yourself get lost in your role as a parent. Um, just you have this new child. It's it's a, it's a it's consuming your world because it's such a big change, and, and everything everything about that kid centers around it needing you to do things. Within the next 14 to 15 years, less of those less the kids going to need less and less of those constant things, uh, whatever it is, whether it's feeding, getting them dressed. Those the, those needs are going to go away, and you're still a person. And if you don't carve out and make time for the things that made you you before you had a baby, you're going to struggle to find those things when you have time to do them again, or when, when, you, when you get back to who you are, because you're not going to be a parent of a child that needs you every moment of every day for the rest of your life. And, and hanging on to that identity and, and the things that make you who you are are going to make you a better parent. Um, and more, more importantly, a better partner because you're not going to get done with kids and going, well, who are you again? What are we? What, where, where are we at? So there's a, there's a, there's a real there's a real need to make sure you hang on to the things that make you who you are. And I think that's a valid point too that you're saying. You know, it's stages, and I know it drives some people crazy to hear the advice. Well, it's just a stage. It's just a phase. But I have to admit that that does bring me some comfort when I am up in the middle of the night, um, you know, at 2 a.m. I, I think to myself, okay, you know, that cliche saying the, the days are, are, are long, but the years are short. Like, yes, you have to focus on yourself. Yes, you have to get back to yourself. But in reality, it's not always an option when you're, you know, up in the middle of the night, changing diapers and feeding, and you've got a crying baby on your hands sometimes. Baby does need to come first. Um, so I think putting it into perspective, as hard as that can be in the moment, um, and remembering that, okay, this too shall pass, like we're just, we're, this is the trenches, we will we will have a better day tomorrow, is it, it, a lot of it's a mindset. Yeah, I, I totally um, agree with that. And uh, I think it's, it's hard to see the forest for the trees. You know, that saying where it's like when you're in the thick of it day in and day out, especially when they're very young, when you're in the infancy stage still, it's very hard because they depend on you for everything, for food, for, you know, life, to make sure that they're sleeping correctly. You're doing everything for your babies when they're that little. And it's so easy to lose yourself. And I, I feel like my best advice that I can give is just keep going keep going and remember that it always does get better and there's always a light at the end of the tunnel you know your children will get older and it'll be easier for you to get out of the house it will be more realistic for you to do the things that you once loved to do like per perfect example you know in my past life before our children um, I was an actor and a singer and I really really missed it and I missed having that that in a creative outlet that I felt was a part of me and not being able to do that made me sad. And finally, when my, when my twins were about two years old, that's when I finally felt like I could really get out of the house in the evenings. And I found a local community choir. And it was once a week on Monday nights. And so I stood up and said, honey, I need to do this. And he said, okay, let's make it happen. And so I think it was partly just kind of standing up for myself and saying, I need this thing. And this is what I'm going to do, and here's how long it takes, and here's how often it is. And my husband was very supportive of that. And I know that not all spouses are, so that's a whole other talk, I think, in that. <laughs> um, but I feel like you need to be your own advocate in these kinds of things. It's very easy, especially us moms, it's very easy for us to just stay home and not do those things when really you kind of have to stand up and say, I need this break because if you don't say it, no one will give you that break. Does anyone have anything to say on that? Well, that is one of my uh, one of your cornerstones. That's a good word. <laughs> so I always say, 
Your partner is not your knight in shining, shining armor. Your partner, this dude, is not coming home like, honey, you look tired. What can I do for you? Like, what do you need? No, he doesn't care. He's like, I'm gonna get a beer, I'm gonna lay on the couch and watch a TV show and go in the bathroom for an hour and, you know, sit on my phone. No. And so, like you said, Julie's not. You have to advocate for yourself, and it's it's a very you know it, it took two of you to tango, it took two of you to have a child, and now it's going to take two of you to raise your child. And for for those of you who are either now stay at home moms or going to be stay at home moms, that is not your only job in life, because it took two of you to create life, and and your child deserves to be parented with different philosophies and the two of you and there's more to go around and your child needs to have love from each of you. And so if you, like I said, if you have the confidence and the professionalism to say to your partner, you know what, I want to pursue something else. I need a break. I need a manicure. I guarantee your partner Want, again, wants to make you happy, wants the family to flow. Because your partner is probably like, I want to go bowling, or I want to go have a beer with, or play cards with the guys. And so it's like, I'll, you know, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, and let's make this work. Because, if you again, if you go back to, if your kid is sleeping and on a schedule, then the whole family knows what to expect, and when, you, and when mom and dad can fit in their own needs. But there is nothing wrong with you mom, like, you guys, like, we bring life into this world, not you guys. Sorry, he barely did anything. He had something to do. Barely. <laughs> right, right, right. This right. guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I want you guys to really value your, what you brought to your family now and forever. Because without you, your family wouldn't exist. And without you, your family will not fall apart, but it will be very difficult. And I want you guys to really be proud of yourselves and have the confidence to say, this is what I need, because your partner, again, is not, not a mind reader. So speak up for what you want and need. And I think it goes both ways, too, because also my husband, he wasn't the one wanting to go out with the guys. You know, he was very supportive, and he's kind of a homebody. So I then, in turn, after being like, I'm gonna get out once a week, it was, you need to start doing something, too. Like, you can't just stay at home all the time. You're gonna be depressed. Like, you need to do these things too. So I feel like it goes both, goes both ways. That dads and moms, we each need to find our own time where we do something special for ourselves to balance out the time that we are at home and working along with our partner to support and raise our children. But, you know, it's important also for dads, I think, too. And well, I, I would say there's a big, big piece of this is communication, right? Um, you need, the, you're, it's like you're, you're the business of your family, so you need to be you're, you need to be having regular board meetings and talking about where the money's going, why it's going there, what are you doing, what are you doing for you, what are you doing for your partner, what are your kids doing, what's going what's going on, so that you're making sure that everybody's needs are needs are met. Uh, if if you're the stay-at-home parent, you know, then your full-time job has been taking care of the kids and your partner has been off at work full time doing that doing that job as well. And when you when you get home there needs to be a little bit of a switch, right? Sure you've been doing your full time full time job of, of bringing in the money and whatever that may be. When you get home you haven't had the chance to connect to your kids. And so in, in, in my my experience I, I'm the one that's worked outside of the house. I don't get to have a relationship with my kids if I don't have the time to put in. So it's been, it was always a big priority for me to find that find the time. So I've spent a lot of time when I get home with my kids. But the downfall on that too is I have not I did not spend a lot of time creating new friendships every time we moved. And so I have a great relationship with my friends or with my kids. And when I have issues that I need to talk about that I that are not the ones I want to talk to my wife about, and they're not appropriate for me to talk to my kids about. I struggle with the with the network of people that I would have to talk about, and that's why you know part of why something like Chicago Dad's Group has been great. You find other guys and having a similar experience with you are that you can connect to. But that's the thing of you getting out and your ability to get out at night to do something like that with a bunch of other guys 
means that you made the arrangement with your wife, say, hey, I know you've been with the kids all day, but I'm gonna need to, I need a night out to do this because I'm going to be a better partner if I have a chance to do not work and not kids for one night. And because I realize that you're doing double duty here, here's how I'm going to meet your needs so that you're not always in the place of making sure that my needs are met. And, and, it's, gonna, and it's gonna go across the whole gamut. Like, this is gonna be something that you're constantly doing because there's not equal, right? There's what everybody needs in the moment, making sure that the needs are met, and sometimes your needs are gonna be met more than your partner's needs, sometimes your partner's needs are gonna get met more than yours. The sum total at the end of it is that, that you created a strong, viable relationship, and that comes down to being able to communicate. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> No, I mean, I think that about, um, that about some stuff. Yeah, I really like the idea of a board meeting. Yeah. I was like, I love that you called it that because it's like we need to really discuss the issues are at hand in our family that is our company, and these are the things that need to be addressed. And it's really hard. It's hard to like sit down with your spouse and be like, these are the things we need to talk about because there's a lot of emotions involved in parenting and in being married. And there's just, there's so many things and it's, I always found it hard, especially in the first year, to sit down with my husband and really talk things through because we were just trying to get through the day. We were just trying to make it to you know bedtime. That was basically the goal every night. Um, but one thing I do want to talk about is um, that I was just thinking about as I was listening to you guys is when you become a parent, and someone mentioned it a little bit earlier, I can't remember who it was, the friends that you had before you were pregnant and had kids starts to change your group of friends. And I know that a big struggle that a lot of moms I know and, and probably also dads go through is that once they're you know, going through their parenting years, they're losing a lot of the friends that they once had and finding new friends is a struggle. Can you guys give some advice on finding new friends who are kind of in the same boat? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so, it's, I think that's so, it's, it's a hard, I, I continue to struggle with that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate, personally, to have um, a lot of my friends went through this transition at the same time as me, so that was good, but um, I think you just need to open yourself up to more avenues um, and just really put yourself out there. It's it's a really weird and vulnerable feeling to be like, oh God, like, it feels like you're back in dating. It feels like dating, and, and um, you know, when you go to the playground, you know, I feel like people are like, go to the playground, you'll meet moms at the playground, and I'm always like, this is awkward, like, you can't just, you know, strike up a conversation, hey, like, how many kids do you have? <laughs> um, so, I don't know, for me, I, I, my, I found a local Facebook group, um, you know, my town Facebook group um, of moms was a really great resource for me, um, and and I will say that when your kid does start to go to um, some form of school, whether it's a, you know daycare, preschool, kindergarten, and you like like the light starts to like it starts to open a whole new door for you. It's like a whole new door for you, and um, you'll see people and interact with people and strike up conversations, and all of a sudden you have like a group of friends um, that you didn't even like. It just happened organically and naturally. Um, and that's great, but you don't necessarily want to wait till your kid's going into kindergarten um, to feel like you have like your squad. Um, so, like I said, like I said, I, I just I, you have to be open to lots of avenues um, and just be willing to meet people whenever, wherever. And if it's an online group or um, you know a new a new hobby that you pick up, anything, <laughs> like, you know, just anything. A any, you know, for me, I for me, I just. I would be willing to embarrass myself and <laughs> for the sake of potentially making a new friend. Right. No, I love that. Like, just put yourselves out there. Have, it's get right, like dating. Like, have your three openers. Like, what neighborhood are you in? Are you a stay-at-home mom? Like, does your kid sleep through the night? And because I guarantee if you just put yourself out there, what you're saying, even though you feel like, oh my god, I'm a bumbling idiot, this person thinks I'm a moron, like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, that person is dying for connection and is lonely and needs a friend and is like, yes, I want to talk to you. But that person is like, I'm too scared to talk to you, but you look cool and I like your shoes and I like your sunnies and like, what's going on? So put yourself out there, 
who cares, it's a dating game, and the takeaway is it just takes a couple of like connections, and you just want to have friends who are like-minded, who are parenting the way you are, and you guys like have things in common, and you don't have to have like 20 mom friends, you just have to have that one, one or two girlfriends, you can call up and be like, oh my gosh, you know, my partner, or my mom, my mother-in-law, um, to, to help you feel less alone in your parenting game. And because we're all alone. We're like, what the heck are we doing? No one knows what we're doing. And so if you just have a few people out there, then you feel more connected and more confident and like, I got this. I'm gonna have a good day. And the idea in parenting is really just to have a good time. And I say, like, if you're not laughing every day, then you're doing something wrong in parenting. So you gotta find that girlfriend, find that boyfriend, you're just like, I just like you. And just like, come over, I haven't showered in two days, I'm in my sweatpants, I look insane, but just help me. So put yourself out there. Sign your kids up for classes, right? Like, Park District, YMCA, and I, this isn't, I'm, I'm not talking about competitive soccer or competitive basketball, I'm talking about learn how to play basketball, swimming class, uh, make some art, and show up early to pick your kid up. And when you show up, conveniently leave your phone in the car. Because one reason like we don't connect is because we get up there, we get some other place to pick up our kids and You don't know who's around you, right? And that, that's a great place to to make those connections because anybody who signed up their kid for that cl class also has a kid. <laughs> that's why they're there. They're in the same boat as you are. Because you, you do you do this natural shift. And your friends, most likely, are going to catch up to you. So your friends are coming back. They're just not with you right now. It's like it's like when you were in sixth grade and you went to seventh grade and in, in the junior high school and your sixth, and your fifth grade friends were moving into sixth grade and that year you didn't get to play together and you were different. You went on, you made new friends, and they caught up. Oh, hey, you meet this new kid. They can't, they're coming back, but in the in the in the immediate you need, you need those connections. So like I'll advocate for the dads group all day long and say come join the dads group, get to meet the dads if you have it. That's a great way for dads to do it. But moms, dads, and everybody else. Um, these classes, like you want your kid to learn how to swim. That's it's an important thing just to learn in general. You want your kid to have a chance to learn to make art, for example, or have a music class or something that's just easy, non-competitive, non, non. It's not important that they become great at it. It's important that they're in there socializing for their own right. But it gives you that outlet to connect to somebody else who has a kid who understands the role that you're in. She's killing it, by the way, right now. I just want you to know. I've been watching you the whole time, and I'm like, uh, you're killing it. So, girl, use that bathroom. God love you. You're going to get back to yourself someday, too. I'm just telling you right now. She is amazing. Mom of the day, right now. Um, <laughs> I just was watching her, and she was so incredibly dedicated to her children. It was just, she was like chill, man. She was not freaking out at all. I'm sorry. I was in awe of this woman. Okay, anyway, moving on. Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, I have one more question for you all, and then I'd like to kind of open it up to floor for any questions that you guys may have, because I would love to hear if there's any issues that are going on right now that you would like some advice on. But I would like to get your number one tip for regaining yourself and sanity as a parent. Okay, well, for me, um, sanity and me time go hand in hand. Sanity and sleep go hand in hand, but, um, but me time, um, I had to really wrap my brain around in the beginning. I'd be like, I need me time, me time, me time. Um, I had to wrap my brain around redefining what me time is. My me time before I had kids looks a lot different than my me time after I had kids. So you have to get creative and find ways to like, find ways to recreate me time. So for example, my, um, my son, when he was a baby, um, he would fall asleep in the car. He was like a car sleeper, no matter what. And you couldn't, you couldn't like even pick the car. Like the second you pick the car seat up out of the seat, he'd be like. So it was like if I was going somewhere, I knew he was gonna nap, and then nap time was gonna be ruined, and then I wasn't gonna be able to do any work or get anything done or have my like minute of sanity. So if I was going somewhere, it was a commitment. So I was like, oh god, I'm never gonna be able to balance this. 
So finally I thought to myself, okay, like I can't sit at home all day. I have to figure out a way to make this like to to make this nice for myself. So anytime we'd go anywhere, he'd fall asleep right away and we'd run a little errand and then I'd be like, all right, well, we're stuck in the car now for an hour. So I decided, you know what? I'm gonna like find me my local drive through Starbucks. Um, and I kept a book in my car because I realized after I had kids, I like stopped, I kind of stopped reading. Like I never, like I didn't have the time or I was falling asleep. So I would, fall asleep, I'd go through the drive through Starbucks, I'd get myself a latte, I'd like park and like crack the window and then like sit in the parking lot and read for an hour. It's not ideal, it's not like the me time I wanted, but it's something for yourself and it's some way to sort of like reclaim the me time and gain back a little bit of quiet and sanity. So for me it's just getting it's just getting creative with your me time. I incorporated my kids into stuff I like to do. I, <laughs> um, because when you're like like me, and I, I have two boys, I mean, it's a little bit easier. But I, mean, I was I grew up a comic book nerd. I grew up doing nerd stuff, and so my kids my kids play stupid games like Magic the Gathering with me, or we go and watch all like. So you've basically created your new best friends. I, 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 <laughs> I, I, you know, I was careful, like, because I want them to do their own things. I don't want to be the center of their world, but, but it worked out. I, I knew what my passions were, and and I found ways to, if they showed the interest in it, incorporated them into passions. That's, that was one of them, and, and the other one is, and I'm going to go back to the communication thing because I cannot harp on this one enough. Um, and obviously it doesn't work if you're in a single parent situation, but if you find some, find some way to get someone else to watch your kids, even if it's just for an hour, right? The, the babysitting's worth it. If there's a trade-off for your babysitting, um, we did, when we were in, in California, we did something called the Babysitting Co-op, where we got a bunch of families together, and we all gave out, you know, Everyone had six hours of babysitting coupons, and you gave that to someone that gave them now that person had seven hours of babysitting coupons to follow. And we're trading kids all the way around, but it, but it meant um, my wife could go to the grocery store without taking the kids. Or it meant that if my wife was doing something, I could go do whatever I needed to do without the kids. The flip side of that was like, if I had nothing going on, I was just gonna be at home. I, let everyone know and said, hey, I will be sitting at home. If you have stuff to do, drop off your kids and your coupons and I'll be right here. So that, that was a way to kind of like create create those spaces. And there's a lot of creative ways to do it, but you know, if, if you can communicate with your partner, give them space to do their thing, they will give you space to do your thing. And once you do that, leave them the hell alone. <laughs> like for an hour, you can solve every problem with your kid, I assure you. <laughs> word no, stand behind it, and set boundaries between your friends and your family. Because when you have a baby, everyone wants a piece of you. Well, there's only so much of you to go around. And when you as a nuclear unit decide we are only focusing on our four walls and serving what we want to need, and we will accept invites and brunches and visitors as time allows it keeps your home very calm but when families keep saying yes like come 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 and stay 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 well you know what mommy's already been through war having a baby it continues for several months with the hormones and she gets run down and partner doesn't know how to help and now we have a continuing rotating door of visitors and friends and going to grandma's 90th birthday at 8 p.m. dinner, like when our baby goes to bed at 7 p.m., no, it's not gonna work. So what happens is we hear a lot of outside influences. Well, like, oh, well, you know, Aunt Jean, you know, they come to everything. Well, great. I don't know how Aunt Jean's doing. I don't know how her kids are doing. You know what? This serves us well. 
this is how we run our family. This is when Johnny naps and we can come to 5 p.m. dinner and we can't wait to see you at 5 p.m. But no, we're not coming at 7 p.m. Because if we come at 7 p.m., Johnny's gonna be an a-hole and he's going to cry and no one's going to appreciate it and then he's gonna fall asleep in the car on the ride home and then be awake at midnight. And that's not gonna be great for me because I'm gonna go to the gym in the morning and I'm gonna be tired and I'm gonna be cranky and I'm gonna yell at him. All because we went to this thing. So put your kid on the schedule, fit your needs around your baby, and then fit in the outside influences. But don't be afraid to say no because they don't know what's going on within your home. Take care of you and that's all that matters because when your family is thriving, you are a happy, happy camper. People will adapt to the space that you give them. So if you create nice. greater boundaries, yeah. they will adapt to your boundaries. And so stay strong. Don't don't give them an inch. Nope. Okay. So they, will, <laughs> they will they will expand to fill all the space you give them. <laughs> um, one last thing I wanted to say about um, you know how like I guess what my top advice for getting back to you would be is um, think about before you were a parent what your true passions are. Are you a runner? Are you a singer? Are you an artist? Do you just like playing Magic the Gathering? You know, these kinds of things. Go back to what you really, truly loved to do and figure out how you're gonna get it done now in this new setting. Because eventually, your kids are gonna grow up. They're gonna grow up and they're gonna have their friends and they're eventually not going to want to hang out with you anymore. So this is the end game. It seems very far away. It really isn't. It's going to go faster than you think. And so you can't lose who you are at the core. Like, yes, I won't be able to be back on stage for a long time, and I understand that. But I can't let go of performing, and I'm finding ways to do it myself. So my advice to you is figure out how you can do that thing you like. If you are a runner and you used to be on a running team and now you can't commit to that, run on your own. Put the kids in the stroller. Get a nice jogging stroller and run with the kids in the jogging stroller and do it every day. And figure out how you're going to be able to adapt to your new you. Because I, I truly feel like, you know, you have children. You chose to go on this parenting journey. You are never 100% going to be the same of who you were before. You have changed from the inside out having these children and now you are the new you and you're figuring out how you're going to take the old you and kind of move it into this new world that you're in and how you're going to keep those pieces of you that you always have been and make it even better into this new life of having these incredible kids who have changed you forever I mean my children I they're so phenomenal like I every day they brighten my life and I would never, ever, ever want to go back to the way it was before I had kids. But now, I have to make a new reality for myself. And that's okay, because this is what I wanted. And it's changing me as a person, and I like that. I like who I am turning into now. It's more interesting, it's more exciting, it's more what I always wanted, you know? So figure out how you're gonna take those pieces that you used to have and how you're gonna make it a new you. Um, so on that note, are there any questions, any concerns you guys want to talk about? I'd love to see some hands in the air. Yes? Um, I don't know if it's a concern so much as it's something that's on our minds, but managing um, the balance of grandparents. And we both have pretty strong and hands-on parents who we're both very close with. But it's just something that we've seen in cousins, um, Do the grandparents live here? Neither of our grandparents. How far away are they? Houston and St. Louis. Okay, so you have that going for you. <laughs> <laughs> so would, you, would anyone want to jump in? Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, how do you manage grandparents that are very involved and I would take it a little aggressively involved? Eager. Eager and enthusiastic grandparents. First grandchild on both sides, how do you kind of deal with, with all of that excitement, we'll call it? I'll take that. I mean, that's amazing. It's amazing that they're eager, and it's amazing that they're far. But with that being said, <laughs> I think it's all about communication. And what are their expectations?
patients? Are they going to be here once a month? Do they expect you to go down? Like, who's going where? How long are we coming? Are we staying with you? No longer than three nights? Like, wh what? How does this look? And what do they want? So ask them. How do they think it looks? So the biggest thing I see at Get Mom, my co coaching business, there's completely different generational parenting differences from all of us to them, right? So they look at us, you know, as we are helicoptering, micromanaging, you know, with all the devices and the schedules. And but here's the thing: they love you. They can't wait to meet your baby. They want the best. And if you are just very clear on after you know, you you want to you want to pet them. We're excited. Like, what are you guys thinking? When do you want to come? Like, what do you want to do? And then just take it in. And then you guys make the decisions. You are the parents, right? They're not the parents. This is a privilege for them. And we want to make them feel loved and heard, but you are still the decision makers. But it's like a it's like a dance, right? So as long as you two are in sync, then you sprinkle them in however it works. Yeah. And you know that what you just said reminded me of something I like to say, which is, uh, this is your turn. They had their turn when you were their children. So now it's your turn. And you get to do, you know, your way. Because that was always something that, I mean, I'm very lucky that my mom, like, is very, like, she knows when to push things and when to step back. But I'll, some people don't know how to kind of keep things to themselves. Um, so that can also be an issue, you know, everybody has their opinions, but at the end of the day, everyone can give you their opinions, but you get to pick what you actually want to do. And, you know, if they're too sensitive, that you can't stand up and say, okay, we're doing it our way, uh, it may come to that where you have to push back and say, look, this is how it's going to have to be. I love how involved you are, I love all of the advice you're giving us, but we ultimately need to choose what advice we take. Uh, you don't have to come out and say that until it gets to that point, but just know, behind closed doors, you do what you want. Um, and the, yeah. these guys, the, your, the grandparents, they, they could be like amazing babysitters. You guys can yeah. like say, we're feeling out of here. Like, we need to sleep and like come in, you know, and that might give them a lot of ownership and feel like, oh my gosh, like this is our baby. Like we get this baby without these too. You know, and that really turns on grandparents, I'm telling you. They I like to have all that power. Um, and so it's up to you guys to let go of the reins and be like, all right, we're peeling out of here. And your friends can be like, oh my God, you're going to a hotel or you're going on a state for two nights like, or whatever the heck it is. So take advantage of that. You're going to find that balance. And it's awesome that they're eager. Yeah, I was going to say just like baby thrives on a schedule, like sometimes grandparents do. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate on both sides. They're all very involved, but also all very eager. So reining, reining them in the way that I needed to, I um, neither of them understood this, that I was on a schedule or anything like that. It was sort of on their own time. And so I literally would write out, when they were there, I would write out a schedule. And it would include, like, I'm checking out at this time. Like, you're checking in. So that helps. And, and you know what? I think they were reticent to accept that at first. Like, oh, we don't need a schedule. But then they realized, like, oh, this is like, this is a, setting up a flow, not only for you, not only for baby, but it's sort of managing our expectations. And it was really, like, it's beneficial for everybody. I have three things. <laughs> I want you to practice this right now, girl. Mm hmm. <laughs> Smiling mm -hmm. at me. You're gonna get a lot of advice from everybody's parent, especially your parents, and they're gonna say something like, "Oh, well, I saw your partner do this." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You guys are on the same team. You, the grandparents are not on your team. They're fantastic coming in. They're, they're gonna be fantastic for a lot of things, but you guys are the team. So your your parents don't say to him, say about him, "Oh, I saw this," and you go, "Oh yeah, I know he does that thing." Or, and you don't, and they, your parents don't see what she's doing and go, oh, well, she should be doing, and you go, you just go, mm hmm, mm hmm. Do not piss anybody off. It doesn't matter what they say. You guys are on the same page. You do your thing. You guys are going to parent the way you're going to parent, and, and that's, that's the end of, end of it. You're going to make mistakes. People are going to point them out to you, and you're going to go, mm hmm. So you practice that thing. You guys stay on the same team. 
when you have the grandparents watch your kids, they are not going to, that's number two, they are not going to do what you ask them to do. Own that, accept that. You're not going to change it. They are going to do the things, they are going to do the things that they think is the right way and you're, and you're going to have to rebuild from that and that's just the way it is. That is the price you pay for having a night off and that it is worth it. It's true. They will have lots of candy coming home with them at the end of the night. And <laughs> no, number three, just embrace the fact that they love your kids. Right? Because here's, here's the most fabulous thing about it is, is, is grandparents are in this unique space that they get to come in and love on your kid, but they get to go away. Right? So let them come in and be that. Let them, let them have that because in about 20, 30 years, that's going to be you. And so be the kind of parent that you want your kid to be when you become a grandparent. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, how did you guys kind of arrive at your schedules? And what kind of things, at what, I don't know how to ask that. What kind of things, at what stages did you go, this is scheduled, and what kind of things are scheduled? Is that kind of clear? <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So, you take it away. This is what I do. <laughs> sleep, sir, number one is sleep. Sleeping through the night. 12 hours unassisted. Means. 12. Not, not. Asleep, but unassisted, 100%. I'm not kidding you. For four years under, there's no negotiations on this. It means you walk out of a bedroom at 7 p.m., see at 7 a.m. I don't know what your kid's doing, I don't care, but it's now mommy and daddy time. So you start there. And then the daytime schedule builds from that 7 a.m. wake up, or 7.30 to 7.30, or 8 to 8, whatever. However, you need to start your family in the morning to get out the door to where we have to be. So typically, a six-month-old is on a two-nap schedule. So then let's say you have a 7 a.m. wake up, then you start at a 9.30 a.m. nap, lasts an hour to two hours, and then you know as a mom, as a dad, as a grandparent, or as a caregiver, when that child wakes up, we schedule in errands, the gym, the grocery, coffee time, whatever it is. So the idea is baby's needs are taken care of first, parents' needs come second. But what's so great about a schedule is the child is predictable. So you can say, we can do family photographs at 11.30 a.m. because the baby sleeps from nine to 11. The baby's not gonna be freaking out at 11.30 because we know the child will predictably sleep and be rested and happy and ready, shiny, ready to go. Um, and then you go into, as I said, your child's getting older, and then they shift to a one nap schedule, and then you shift to that. So the idea is it starts with overnight sleep, and you start with the morning nap, the afternoon nap, then it goes to one nap, and it's all about baby's needs come first, around the schedule, and then mom and dad know when they can sprinkle in their life into it. Sleeping, eating, feeding, does that help? Playing? Okay. Yeah, once again, the sleep, oh, yeah, we're saying, like, I'm not, I'm not a magical unicorn. Like, I've been doing this six years. I have three kids. 12 hours overnight is the norm. That's what you want. And then your life is magical. Once, so my, um, once my twins were sleeping through the night, it was like the best day of my life. But yeah. um, <laughs> it's something that came gradually, and I kind of did on a, on a slow, and I had a very specific way that I wanted to try all the different sleep training techniques before we went to cry it out, because I wanted to not do it if I didn't have to, right? Because you feel horrible. So I basically read every book and did everything. And we started when they were about five months old. And, and I recommend that you speak with your pediatrician and make sure that your child weighs enough for them to be not having those feedings overnight. And then you slowly take away those middle of the night bottle or food, whatever you're giving them. And I know it, it can be more difficult when you're breastfeeding because they're so physically attached to you when it comes to, when, if you're just bottle feeding, it, it's somewhat easier because if you don't have the bottle there, there's nothing for them to, to, to drink. Um, but uh, it was a very, it was a gradual over the course of about three weeks is what it took for us to kind of gradually, you know, decrease the amount of formula they were getting in their bottles until finally it was all water and then they kind of stopped waking up for it. And then we did, so that was the late night feed, the 2 to 3 a.m. feed, and then we started doing the, um, 
you know, that dream feed at 10 p.m. We started weaning them off of that. And then once we really knew that they didn't need the nutrition at night because they were so solid during the day on napping and feeding and they were getting everything they needed during the day, we were confident, okay, we can try, cry it out because we need to because we're gonna lose our minds. And we need to get back to us and we're losing it and we cannot focus at work, we cannot properly drive a car without a feeling like we might fall asleep at the wheel, which is a serious concern. And uh, so we finally did it and it sucked. It was rough. It was like six nights of, oh my God, should we go in? No, don't do it. <laughs> and watching on that little video camera and like freak, like, are they gonna be okay? Um, but yeah, they got it. And it, that was, the, you know, having twins, it's different. You know, there's two of them to wake each other up all night long, but eventually they did sleep together in the same room and that was the best night of my life. It, uh, they were five months, three weeks, and one day old. Not that I'm counting. Uh, but I know exactly when it happened. So it was really, once they started sleeping through the night, that the schedule in general for our family really started to solidify. And, you know, as Irene mentioned, you know, knowing when naps are going to be able to happen, you can then better schedule your day. And I think a lot of it is also letting your family and friends know that, yeah, that nap is really important when they're little. And it's not going to be like that forever. You know, once my kids hit, like, I think two and a half or three, they were done with napping. They were like, no, nope, we're done. So then all of a sudden it was like, okay, now we have all day to figure out what we're gonna do. But then we still had to kind of schedule in break time, you know, time for rest. So that as parents, we weren't like completely crashing at the end of the day, making sure that we have some downtime to ourselves at some point in the day. And um, yeah, so that's what worked for us. And, the, and, the, and the setting the schedules is gonna be good long term. Like my, kid, like my kids right now are 13, 14 years old. They don't want to go to bed at 9 o'clock, which has been our standard up until this point. So now we've just got to the point where I care what you do, you're not, you're either in the basement or you're up in your room, and I don't want to see you. <laughs> you know? And that, because that time's going to be valuable for you and your partner as well, right? So, so schedules, schedules and boundaries of communication are. Another reason schedules are awesome. It takes the guesswork out, out of like, what does my baby need? Is my baby tired, hungry, wet? Well, if you always know when your baby's eating and sleeping, then you're like, oh, I know what the baby needs. That's what's really great about this guy. Anything else? Well, thank you all for coming. And we lost some people as well. That's fine. You guys suck for you. You stayed with us. So that means you win eight for the day, gold stars all around. And thank you all for everyone on our panel. And thank you all for coming and enjoying. And have a great day, you guys. We hope you enjoy the show.